It's interesting when you have conversations based on relationship, how that takes you where you need to go. So the reason we met, Paul, was I was fussing to my team. Hey, man, I'm, I'm seeing too many appraisals come in low. So I've got, I've got at, at Space and Equity, what we, we do several different things. One is we've got a Scooter's Coffee franchise that we bought into. Um, the other is that we are a commercial loan broker. I spent 14 years as a commercial banker. So very in that process, the you know, oftentimes your collateral, your asset is real estate. And so the appraisal is a critical component of that transaction. It kind of it makes or breaks the transaction. Yeah. And so I'll say this: I have I had a client, a physician that I financed his his third office for his, he's an OBGYN, finance his third office. Then we, at the bank I was working at, not only could I do commercial, I would do their residential stuff. So I was financing his construction of his primary residence. Uh -huh. um, it was in a neighborhood, he, he was using the same contractor that other people in the neighborhood were using, building custom $3 million home in Texas, probably in San Francisco would be $10 million home. Right. So really nice home. Yeah. Exact same specs from a square footage standpoint, uh, new build, same builder. So same architect, all that stuff. His home came in 60,000 below what we expected in the appraisal. It didn't kill the deal, but it hampered the deal. So I was like this, and it was what we were just deciding whether or not it was worth it to fight it. We decided not to fight it. Mm -hmm. Um, then in my situation, so our home, we bought it in 2016. Like most real estate, it is appreciated significantly in value. So I reach out to, because of the scooters, I was like, man, I need some more cushion from a cash standpoint. Let me pull some equity out the house. Yeah. So I call, I got a credit card with Discover. I should have known, I always do, I'm a banker, so I know about relationship. I was like, ah, I've been with Discover for 20 years. So, and they do it home equity. So I call them. They quoted me, this is before they did the appraisal, but I said, stop right there. They quoted me the less than the tax value of the home. I was like, how do you come up with that figure when the tax value, I'm paying 150 more in taxes than what you quoted me. And the property, I know Zillow's not I, perfect, but it gets you a good idea. Yeah. I said, it's 260,000 higher on there. We're going to fall. We're not going to fall where you guys are. So I told him, nah. And then with the straw that broke the camel's back is I got I had a client that is uh, former NFL players now moving into development. His appraisals came in. I was like, I'm, I'm just tired of this. Like every time the sponsor is black, it seems like we're running into this. So then my sister was like, Hey, you should reach out to Paul. I said, like, Who's Paul? And so she explained, and she was like, Yeah, he was on. I mean, it even got all the way to it was on 60 Minutes. So here we are. <laughs> you bought a house in California. You picked the house up. Tell me. Tell me from there. Yeah, so we bought our house. We also bought our house in 2016, right? Uh, we bought what's called a traditional pole home. Yeah. So Marin City was birthed out of World War II, uh, where black, a bunch of Black folks migrated to work in the shipyards, which is in Sausalito. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of history is um, after, you know, after in 1942, so around, right before around 46, once the war ended, or 42, 43, once the war ended, black people wasn't able to buy land mm -hmm. anywhere else in Moran. Yeah. So they end up settling here in Moran City. So then around in the 50s, what they did is they, you know, came together and made a big push for these homes to be built. Mm -hmm. And so we have these prefab homes all along the hillside. It's probably about 300 of them, um, give or take. And they're called pole homes. So they were literally extended onto telephone poles and there were three different models so we bought our home in 2016 um, it belonged literally to one family um the spigners so the spigners owned it they pat died and left it to their daughter and then we bought it from her and she was super kind because for a year straight we was getting outbid left and right because marin city was going through gentrification or is currently trying to be gentrified, right? Like white people is like, oh my goodness, this is like a gym 
in the middle of uh, in the middle of Moran, which is arguably one of the richest places in California. We're seven minutes away from the Golden Gate Bridge, but because we also have a huge population of public housing, and we is always traditionally looked at as a black community, mm -hmm. um, our property values uh, were still low, even up in, considerably for Moran was kind of low. So we bought our house and we loved it, right? Like, all right, let, we knew instantly once we was able to get in and get it, what we was gonna do. So we did an initial upgrades to the house, mm -hmm. uh, new kitchen, new bathrooms, uh, created a master suite because uh, it was a four two. So we knocked out a wall in the back, mm -hmm. turned it into a three two, um, just, you know, put in a bunch of work. So we went through, you know, we, so, and then, so that was like our first build out. And then we got our house appraised that one time in 2019, I want to say. Mm -hmm. And at that time, our house appraised for um, just above a million dollars. So okay. we were like, oh, this was good. Yeah. All right, now let's then, you know, so now 2020 was coming up and we knew we wanted to do an additional, mm -hmm. we wanted to add like an additional 1200 square feet to our home. Okay. And that's what we did. We did, we put, this was like our big build out. Mm -hmm. um, we stretched our house out like another eight feet. We added a deck, the doors behind us, which, you know, they all open up, they all collapsible doors. We added that and we have views. We have water views, um, wow. beautiful water views. We got mountains right behind us with a walking trail. Um, we added an apartment downstairs, a one bedroom apartment that's about 600 square feet. Mm -hmm. And so we were excited, right? And so he's like, okay, it's 2020, um, right, right around February, January, February. We noticed that the uh the which call this was real low the uh the interest rates were really yeah. low mm -hmm. we were like all right let's get in we only had we just needed a, a few more dollars anyway just to fix up a few odds and ends but we all well, well the purpose was really just to take advantage of the low interest rates okay so we had a lady came out her name is janet miller mm -hmm. um and i was home right and I thought we had a really good rapport. You know, she was complimentary of our home, you know, explained that she's been in this industry for over 30 years. She has her own practice mm -hmm. um, and it's right here in Marin County. Yeah. So I was like, all right, I, I thought it went well. Wife come home, I yeah. talked to her about it. And she was like, oh, well, that's good to hear because we did our homework. We know, we knew what our, what our house should appraise for her around right just by looking at some of the comps um either in the area or a mile away which is in sausalito or a mile away in mill valley mm -hmm. just from the square footage of our home and the lot that we set on that we sit on because we have a corner lot so we got a a pretty nice it's like a quarter acre of a lot okay um but then when the appraiser when the appraisal came back a week later um it came in underneath a million dollars mm -hmm. at nine nine eight yeah and we were just like before and you had an appraisal in 19 before you even extended the 1200 square feet and the other additions and that was above a million that was above a million yeah yes yes that was above a million right so you so we looking at the two and we like oh like this can't be real mm -hmm. um we was like what are we going to do about it and so we contacted our broker and he was real honest because he he looked at it also and he was like yeah this this don't look right mm -hmm. um, he was like let's go ahead and fight it but he was also real honest and told us that there's a possibility that you could get denied and you might have to just keep the the appraisal that she sent but we're gonna go after it we're gonna go ahead and do it so, you know, that process, you know, I think it cost us like another hundred and twenty five dollars. Mm -hmm. But what we missed out on or before I jumped there, it was like one hundred and twenty five dollars. You have to do a whole write up. Thank God I got a wife that's a principal mm -hmm. and she's good with that pen. <laughs> um, but we was we were so upset, you know, what I mean, like we were emotionally. Yeah. Drained. Yeah. You know, um, it was like, you know, like what, how could she? 
And then we looked at the comps that she pulled. She compared our home to a town home. Um, she called Marin City a distinct market. And I'm like, yo, what, what does that mean? Like, that's pseudo, pseudonyms, yes. What makes it a distinct market? Because it were historically a, a black area, like, yeah. you know, like our property values aren't worth the same. Huh. Um, she dinged us for being on a hill. And everybody was like taken away with that. They was like, yo, like people. That's a good thing, man. <laughs> yes. People will pay for this view. Uh -huh. Like big dollars. Like if you, uh -huh. when you come to California, that's one of the things, especially Northern California, the houses on it are, are always trying to be on hills because everybody wants a view. Mm -hmm. Right. And especially if you can have water views and we have water views of the bay. Um, so it was just going through that entire process not realizing or not or just going through those three weeks of waiting to hear back if they was going to grant us another appraisal yeah when we heard uh heard back that they would three weeks three weeks later that they'll send somebody else out you know me and my wife was like well what are we gonna do you know and she was like well we know traditionally white people get the best of everything yeah yeah. So in order for us to at least feel comfortable, we was like, let's just see what's going to happen. So we asked one of our uh, white friends, her name happened to be Jan also, mm -hmm. uh, to come over and to step in as if she was Tanisha. Okay. And she was like, yeah, because she's about this work, about equity work. And so yeah. she's like, no problem. Um, but it was humiliating, even within that, that conversation and what we had to do next. So you know, I got a piece of art behind me. Huh. We got art all throughout our home that resembles who we are. Yeah. We had to take it all down. You know, go yeah. through our kids' rooms. Um, like literally, like books, like we boxing stuff up, damn near like we're moving. Mm -hmm. Um, because we just we had to make, we had to do what they call whitewash your home. Yeah. Um, and we just moved everything into to our shed. And we were like, well, let's see what's going to happen. Um, our lady, Jan, came over. She brought like one picture of her family. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, two weeks later, we get, a, we get the appraisal that comes back and it appraised for one point, almost 1.5, 1.49 something. But it literally is 500, just underneath $500,000. To whitewash your home, you added five hundred thousand dollars in equity. And the truth of the matter is, there's some. The reality is, you did by whitewashing, you did add equity because what's diabolical in this is she's thinking about the end consumer. In her mind, the end consumer is a white family, and a white family is going to be more comfortable buying their home from a white family. Than buying it from a black family so even though your home was worth that it is worth less because your blackness in some way taints the home taints the home 100 percent. that's that's and that's what it did in her eyes and traditionally we've seen it across the board that that's what happens yeah to black people um yeah. you know we went to the white house and had an opportunity to, to be part of a panel um, with Secretary Fudge and Assembly Lady Rice. Mm -hmm. And even Secretary Fudge said her house even got appraised like $30,000 less than a home. Literally, she said, uh, across the street and maybe two blocks down. And she's like, I live, it, I, my house is bigger. Um, it's, a, it's a bigger lot, more bedrooms, beautiful home. But because this home is across the street and two two houses are two blocks down and consider it was uh, a, a white neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know, it, it just and she and so just everybody could get affected by it, no matter who you are, depending on the color of your skin. Appraisers look at you differently. Yeah. And the thing about the challenge, I, especially in light of what happened on Saturday in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. The challenge we face as a nation is that white supremacy is so ubiquitous. It's so woven into the fabric of this nation 
that we think that for racism to occur, an 18 year old needs to shoot 10 black people, innocent black people, because he's saving the white race. And you know, that's not, he doesn't have the power. The guy who called me a, a nigger when I ran on the football field at Clemson, he, that's not where the real power, the real power is in this appraisal process. Yes. That's the real power because the thought process is this is that manifest destiny that applies to white people that whatever is out there is mine. Yeah. Um, and so as I gentrify the neighborhood, as I turn it over and it no longer becomes this unique historical neighborhood that the only place that black, what was historical about it? Because of racism, we couldn't, we couldn't secure land that we should have secured. Maybe that we should have secured after 40 acres of the mill that never took place. We only had this. And now you realize, oh, it's only seven minutes for the Golden Gate Bridge. Now I want that. And I want that. If I want something, I got to have it. If I got to have it, I got to buy it under market because I'm buying it from Black people that yeah. this, it, I have to improve the house, whitewash the house to bring its value up, unfortunately. So if, in, in the Buffalo situation, we say, oh my gosh, this kid was so evil. No, he grew up in an environment that said that all of this belonged to him. And if he doesn't have all of this, there's something wrong with that. Yeah. And I could take it, right? Like, and I could take it. Thing. That's the whole thing. That's the break. That's why we need to literally overturn and break down systems, because mm -hmm. the systems was always developed. They was developed and made for white people. Yes. Yes. You know, and and it's hard for people that's in power, white people, to really look at that through their through, through their lens and say, "God, leash." You know what we've done historically mm -hmm. have been nothing but taken like are we just gonna take 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 yeah all the way and all the time yeah. and say hey we need to like scale not only scale back but deconstruct mm -hmm. all of our systems that does not that that then won't put them in favor yeah right yeah. um if we really talking about equity and so and i don't know if we're gonna ever get there you know i at least i know here in california they're seriously looking at reparations Mm -hmm. You know, we would we would have thought that a long time ago that they would have pushed this forward because they've given everybody else some sort of refer reparations yeah. here in America, yeah. um, except for the except for black folks. Yeah, somehow, like, and, and nobody's dismissing the atrocities that happened to other people. No. You know, Native Americans were almost annihilated and and taken off the planet. So yeah, I understand every uh, measure of restoration that occurs in that community it makes sense uh as far as the japanese internment camps and world war ii understand every form of restitution makes sense same thing with the holocaust every form of restitution makes sense but somehow slavery wasn't that bad they were because i guess they were saving us from our savage selves and and <laughs> rather than and that's where we have to i think the opportunity is this you can do yes and. So yes, reparations are necessary, and but I'm not gonna worry, I'll wait around for it. Yeah. And we, we have to understand and know that people move in groups. And if we are accosted as a group, we have to restore as a group. Yeah. If you wanna come along and utilize your humanity to, to intertwine with my humanity, my white brother and sister, Come along, but while if it's if it's taking you too much time to get there, we need to collectively work together and say, all right, how do we build our own institutions like we've done it before and keep yeah. one again? So rather than, you know, I don't know what Biden's response was yesterday, but it's probably rather benign to what happened in Buffalo. But rather than wait around for Biden to give us what we think we need as a result of helping him get in office, we could say all right we want to create you know didn't they create an act after there was rise in asian terrorism oh, against asians absolutely they did they okay. acted a, a legislation to counteract that but when our legislation comes up as people of color no black people are the ones who've been historically lynched since slavery yeah um so and if black people were it wasn't people of color it was black people that were killed, 10 black people. We, 
if we had the power in Buffalo to say this won't happen because we control this part of the economy, then we can change that. But since we don't control any part of any economy, we can just complain that this is not right, this is not fair, and life is not fair. And the people just say, I'm sorry that happened to you, but uh, keep hope alive. I don't want to, I, I do, yes, keep hope alive. And we want to see some actions. We want to see some action. You can't demand action without resources. Yes. Our whole or, our organization exists because of that. Mm. We have to have financial resources. We have to have real estate. We have to have industry. We have to have capital to demand change. Everything. Yeah, because because money talks. Money talks. Right? Money talks. So like we're in the middle of a lawsuit right now, which is gaining a lot of traction because, you know, that's how white people get things done. Yeah. They, sue, they sue people. Uh -huh. like we're gonna if it, if it's not working the way that I want to or I, or I'm being affected by it in this way, I'm gonna sue you. I'm gonna sue you. I'm gonna sue you. And yeah. so you know, as 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 black people, that we need to get on, get on board with that a lot more. Yeah, you and know, even I, to sue, we gotta have capital to sue. That is true because it do. Gotta, and that's and that's the thing about resources. You know, we're starting an organization. I love my attorney. We paid him thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> In the past year and we still we haven't made a dollar worth of coffee yet now all the 30 but we knew we wanted infrastructure right we knew if we're going to take capital from out private citizens we need to have our ducks in a row we need to be in compliance with the sec and all all that good stuff so we understand that but even in creating a power structure you have to have capital and resources yeah. so the it's you're right. Like, so Mr. Austin and Mrs. Austin, they have the resources to be to engage in a lawsuit. But what happens to the black family that gets exploited and they don't have any resources? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, so, it's the resources and it's the education piece. Yeah. Of it, yeah. Right. Because even going into it, like when our story broke, because to be honest, we were we went through the hoops and it wasn't until a year later that our story got picked up and it got picked up because I do a lot of, you know, I'm out here being an activist in my community yeah. and just and just telling my living truth, yeah. right? Because once it, once we got over that hump, we just was working, we still working, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the brother, Julian Glover from Channel 7, you know, he's like, yo, I read this somewhere in an article, is it true? I'm like, yeah. He's like, I wanna come do a story. Yeah. Our story blew up, it went nationwide. And then next thing you know, then I'm having people from Fair Housing calling me saying, you know, you guys can sue yeah. about this. Yeah. And so like the the just the 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 lack of information that black people have around some of their basic rights. Yeah. Um, is one that we fell into that category also. Yeah. Even though we're 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 two college educated people, you know, doing really good work, we didn't even realize that we had recourse. To be able to reach out to to the um, to the aides from Northern California of housing to be like, yo, this happened to us. What needs to happen? Mm -hmm. um, and so they kind of like, all right. And then they walked us through it. And then we had another group of lawyers that tag team and was like, yo, like we're just going to sue this lady and push this forward because we need to make sure that this sets um, a standard of of operations of how the appraisal system should work yeah. right so not only are we suing her we're also suing i think it's amg mm -hmm. or but it's the overarching company yeah. that's in the appraisers out yeah. uh, because that should have been red flags like what are they doing to hold the appraisers accountable mm -hmm. because really there's no body of work that's really holding appraisers accountable for coming in and lowballing yeah yeah black and brown folks Mm -hmm. And so, you know, now and one of our, our main push that we've been vocal about is that we want to see things change at the at the highest level at legislation. Right. So through the PAVE um, initiative or I don't know if it's a bill, I don't know what it, what they need to call it. I forget, um, you know, and us going to the White House and now with uh, with um, with Biden and Harris saying, hey, yes, things need to change. 
And part of it is more training. They want to get more black and brown people in as appraisers mm -hmm. um, and the accountability piece. But it's still, for me, it's still not clear um, what that accountability piece is going to look like. Yeah. Are, are folks going to lose their license? You know, um, it, it, we have such a long way. And, and through this process, this may be the catalyst to be like, all right, this is what's going to happen. Now you can look at the Austin case and if appraisers continue to mess up, hopefully they'll lose their license. Plus they lose some money. You know, you hit people in a pocketbook, they start to change real fast. Yeah. I think you have to, I agree that all those steps, and I'm glad that you guys are forcing those steps to take place. I think one of the opportunities is if you identify in the appraisal report the race of the owner of the real estate so you can truly compare apples to apples in that accountability piece i think that's huge you got to do it when you put in a, a loan package on the personal side True. you have to identify the race of the individual why because of legislation because black people are historically being barred or denied out of cap bank resources as it pertains pertains to home ownership, personal loans. So they enacted legislation that requires, uh, Regulation B says, you are required to identify the person's race, ethnicity. If they don't want to identify, you can't force Paul to say who or she is, but then you still have to observe. I observe that Paul is, I'm assuming he's black based on what I observe. Mm. Black to comply with it. The same thing should happen with the appraisals. And then yeah. you observe, the disparity in the values you're giving these homes. Yes. You know, wealth is built through real estate. Let's let's not fool anybody. Wealth is built. There's three ways that you can gain wealth. You've got real estate, you've got the market, and you've got entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. But but real estate is the biggest. They say really? over 80, over 80% of wealth has been produced through, through real, estate. real estate. Yeah. Before World War, well, actually before the Revolutionary War, George Washington took down millions of acres of real estate, developed wealth. You know, these slave, like people, when they were trying to get Texas uh, solidified, they were sending poor white folks from Tennessee, from Georgia to Texas and giving them free acres of land. Yeah. That's how they built their wealth. Yeah. And then when you tell somebody their home is worth, 900,000 when it's actually worth $1.4 million when a white person is in there. Think about what that changes to your potential wealth. All right, if you can leverage your house at 80% of the value and it's $1.4 million, that means that uh, 1.2, let's say 1,120,000 is a maximum loan you can have. You probably didn't have that. You, you're the loan you got to actually buy the house and what you owed on it was not 1.12 million. Yeah. So meaning the difference between what you owed, let's say that's half a million dollars, and then that 1.1 million dollars is 600,000. Think of all the different things that you have your hands on that you can do with $600,000 at probably the cheapest form of capital you can get because it's your primary residence. Yes. And this is happening day and day in white families and they're expanding the wealth. They already starting with more equity to begin with. And then as you continue to lowball our appraisals, you are lowballing our ability to expand in certain areas. If I'm a business owner and the, the value needs to hit $2 million and you appraise at 1.6, I got to find more capital to complete my transaction. I mean, the game continues to be rigged, but yet we still fight and we still thrive. We're here on this conversation because we're not going to just sit down and yeah. take that. Why should we? And and, the, and that, that's how I feel about it, right? But then I also, from my lens, because my mom has owned a home here for over 40 years, my Aunt Faye, and what I'm starting to do is I'm looking at, at, at um, I'm looking at their property values now, mm -hmm. you know, and how, and how, you know, appraisers are coming in and looking at um, the homes within Marin City. And so yeah. we just not for for our, our little area and everybody else, but it is it, it's 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 magnifying so much more mm -hmm. on Marin City now, especially when our homes are comparable comparable excuse me comparable to Sausalito, which is 
15 minutes away mm. walking distance, right? Like it's right there and homes there, same property is worth $3 million. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, like my mom should be so wealthy by now, right? Like I shouldn't have to struggle when I went to college because she could have pulled out some money, but because she lived in this neighborhood and was a black, black homeowner, mm -hmm. she wasn't getting her house appraised for. And I was like, whoa, like I'm learning all of this on the fly because of what happened to me. And, you know, I have so many of um, the homeowners in this area that has been here for a long time, that's much older than me, coming and asking us for advice and we're giving the best that we can, but they're like, yo, like, I'm, I'm glad that y'all pushed this forward because our, our property value should rise. You know, it shouldn't always be, um, and they didn't even, you know, because you don't, what you don't know is mm -hmm. you just can't see it. it. It's not, it's not so black and white, the racism. Yeah. Is. Yes. Yes. That's the power. The powerful racism is the racism that is just there. It's not even like, like I said, the guy calling me a nigger in the street, that's not that much power. And we, it seems counterintuitive to say the kid killing 10 people, that's not where the power is. He felt he can call me a nigger in the street and that's okay, it's acceptable. The power is he felt like he could go kill black people to save, in his mind, save the white race. He's 18 years old. He's still developing who he's gonna be, but he grew up enough in an environment to say, these people are worth less than people that have the complexion that I have. Worth and less. if they're worth less, then they can be killed indiscriminately. Yes. yes. And they're not gonna do anything about it. Well, we'll have a, it'll be on CNN for a while. Fox may feature for a couple seconds and then we'll go on to the next story. Yes, because there's there's no orders being put in place to protect the black, the black, black people, mm -hmm. right? To 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 really change white people mindset about the wrong that they do to mm -hmm. black people in every different way, yeah. all the ways that they have traditionally held us back, right? Or tried to utilize their power over us. I had an incident just last week um, with my cousin who, who lives here in Marin also. Um, and he called me because, you know, he's pumping up his tire early in the morning before he getting ready to go to work outside of his apartment. Police rolls up on him, get out the car, and of course, their initial contact is always kind, right? Yeah. How you doing? Oh, what you got going on? Oh, you pumping up your tire? He like, yeah, I got to go to work, right? Thank mm -hmm. you very much. So he giving them the opportunity. I don't want to talk anymore. Thank you. I'm glad y'all came over here. Yeah. And of course, it's the follow up questions, right? Uh -huh. Oh, where do you work at? Where are you Where are you going? Where do you work at? And he's like, uh -huh. I, I, I work in San Rafael, but leave me alone. All right, like yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh -huh. yeah. And then, it, in, and then, you know, he goes to ask the officers, well, you know, you know what, I'm tired of this, like, I'm frustrated already. Let me get your, uh, your card, you know, your badge number in your card. And the officer respond to him is like, oh, why are you upset? You act as if somebody has a gun in your face, or you being detained, uh -huh. or you, you know what I mean, or you in handcuffs. Yeah. So he calls me with this information. I'm like, yo, like what? So I go to the sheriff department to have this conversation with either their 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 sub superior because I know him like because mm -hmm. the work that I do I'm always being an activist but he he's not there but the two officers pull up in a car yeah. and I'm like oh this is perfect let me at least have a dialogue with them so at least they can um, have an understanding of how their words are hurtful and it comes from a, a place of privilege and power yeah we talk for 20 minutes and so the, the, and it came from the lead, the lead like training officer, yeah. he was the one that made the comment. And I'm like, yo, he's like, I just made a general comment. I'm like, there's no way that's a general comment yes. to a black civilian who didn't do anything. And I'm like, you gonna tell him, you know, he's all upset as if somebody has a gun in his face. Yeah. You can't, you can't see your privilege or your, how your biases are showing up. I mean, it was ridiculous, like, and he couldn't, but then I had a follow-up conversation yesterday with his superior, with his lieutenant about the incident. And even the lieutenant is having a hard time. He is like, he's like, Paul, I can see what you're saying because it was on body cam. So he watched yeah, the whole thing. He, he watched the incident with my, with, with, with my, uh, my relative, with my cousin. And then he watched our, the conversation that I had with him. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and I'm, and I'm telling him like your words are hurtful. 
Yeah. Can you see how your words could be hurtful and how you come from a place of power? Yeah. Being yeah. like, well, I didn't mean it to be hurtful. It's not about what you meant. It's about the actions that it was. Yeah. Can yeah. you at least admit admit it? And he just couldn't. It was just, couldn't. and I'm like, that's the problem with policing. And just a whole other tragedy, but it's a problem. It's what the thought process of this. I, I can concede. You hate me for the reasons you hate me. I think they're ridiculous, but I can concede you. Wipe insert racist person in there. Hate me. The challenge I have is why can't you think I don't hate myself? Mm -hmm. The expectation is this. I'm being civil with you based on your state and your caste in society. You should be able to answer these questions. You should know that this is literally a police, but even in a de facto police situation, part of that is, is Black people movement is controlled. You know, post-slavery, when they had the anti-loiterism laws, it's not that it's, we need to know where these Black people are going and why they're going there. So if a white person stops and asks you, especially if it's a policeman stops and asks you, even if it's none of their damn business, it, it is their damn business because they're telling you your movement is controlled. And so the thought process from them was like, look, I was kind, I was cordial. The words, you may have been upset by the words, but the way I delivered that was respectful. So what's the problem? <laughs> and you're saying the problem is I'm a man. I shouldn't have to tell you after I've explained to this stranger that I'm changing my tire because I'm going to work. What else do you need? And they're saying the other piece I need is we need to control where you're going. And since we don't have all the data, we need all the data before we let you go. Yeah. And we're saying, no, I'm, I'm a, that's the thing. We're like, we got confused when we got the passport. We got confused that, that we were full citizens and then, and we're not full citizens in, in the power structure's eyes. Yes. But the good thing is most of us are saying like, I'm not conceding to that regardless of what you say I should and shouldn't do. At the end of the day, I am a full citizen. Yeah. This passport says I'm a full citizen. My, the fact that I'm sitting here as a human being is sufficient enough to say that I have full humanity, even if you don't see it as such. And we need to continue. I think what happens where we mess up is that we, uh, we adjust. We adjust and say, we, we understand this reality. Like if you just play the game right, if you answer those questions, you'll be good. If you do this, but, the, but what you'll find is there's always an exception. You do all the right things and you still get shot. You do all the right things and you still don't get the promotion. So what you have to say is that I am a full man or I'm a full woman or however you see yourself because God says I'm a full person, right? And because that's the case, I'm gonna move and breathe throughout this place independent of what you think I should be doing. I'm gonna do what I believe I should be doing. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. And that's what, like, and that's where the whole, we got to continue to fight against the systems. Yes. Right? We, cause, because, I mean, it is. It, it, my, my sister Amber always call it a disease. Like, white people have a, a really, really strong disease, like anything else around racism, mm -hmm. you know, where it needs to be not only called out, but it needs to be addressed continuously mm -hmm. in order for it to, in order for, for racism to, and it probably would never be dissolved, mm -hmm. but at least for us to be able to move forward. Yeah. Because if it's not addressed, then all these, these incidences, all the, the microaggressions that continuously happen mm -hmm. will then escalate to some of the major incidences that we see yeah. uh, constantly either in the media or for us, even in our own communities, um, because if the dialogue isn't being being had, especially early on, for white people to realize their privilege, mm -hmm. right? Because it is, you know, what I mean, like we can't wait on them, but the systems have to be called out. It has to be um, torn down to say, white people, this is what y'all did. You have to realize that historically, you have always murdered mm -hmm. black people. He has always raped black people. You have always taken whatever you wanted yeah. from black people, right? And you always forced your opinion 
onto others. Yeah. Right. And your opinion isn't the correct one. So the the to so for people to really have, so black people, we have empathy. We've have we have always had empathy. Yeah. We're probably the kindest beings on this earth. Mm -hmm. Right. And so white people have a hard time with having empathy. Mm -hmm. And when you don't have any empathy, then it's so hard to move forward and be like, okay, we need to change things. Yeah, yeah. You know? Why can we do it on the individual bit level and we can't do it on the macro level? If the micro are the sum composite of the macro, how come it can't, like I can have an in, a conversation with an individual white man or woman and I think they can get there in all the spaces that we're talking about. You have friends that get there with you in all those spaces, but then you take it to the collective and you're like, mm. is it because people move in packs and like, I'm not messing this thing up that I got going for me. I mean, that's pretty much what it is, right? Because it is, I hate to say it, but it's gonna take white people mm -hmm. to be able to influence other white people yeah to really change the systems in which they control, yeah. right? They control the education system, the universities, mm -hmm. right? And so it's gonna take them to say, yo, like we need, we really need to change and, and, and utilize our wealth to help create that change. Yeah, Like it, it's gonna take them, it, it's gonna be so hard because they're gonna have to take a, um, a back seat. Right. And all of their reality that they grew up in it has and they're gonna have to take the take the point and say, oh my goodness, everything I've learned, mm -hmm. I have to relearn it again because it's yeah. not true. Yeah. But they probably ain't gonna do that shit. <laughs> I was there, if I was in that place, if I was so while they likely ain't gonna do that, what what do we need to, you know, it's always about what can I can control. You know, yeah. I can't control the way I can control the way I treat my wife, but I can't control my wife. Yeah. So what can we as a group, what are things we can do to be more to improve our situation independent of what they may or may not do? Well, I mean, like you said, you, 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 you we, as black folks, we got to just work more collectively mm -hmm. towards, you know, empowering each other. And for some folks, it may be in the education realm. Other folks, it may be buying land and joining our resources. Cause that's one thing that we don't do is like, how do we, you know, join our resources to buy more property? Yeah. Me and me and my, my, uh, my bigger family, my, my sister, my mom, my aunties, there's a few homes that may be coming on the market here in Marin city. Mm -hmm. And we're kindly, we're already talking about let's bring our dollars together so we could buy that home and, you know, utilize that either a family move in it, but it could be it's property, yeah. right? It's like being able to buy more property for upward mobility is mm -hmm. important. But I think, you know, we just got to educate our own. We got to stand up collectively together and make and come out in numbers to make a bigger push for what is right for us. So sometimes we got to stop asking, mm -hmm. kind of like make a demand. Yeah. Like, yo, like, like, you know, we're, we're going to demand that we need X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. If not, you know, we either going to be out here protesting or we got, or we got to make it uneasy yeah. for the people in power. Yeah. Um, but huh. it's going to, it's, it's changing our mindsets also because we grew up in this fucked up ass system ourselves. Right. Yeah. And so I always believe the system's right. Like, well, maybe black people, it's just their behaviors that get them in this place. If they just would improve how they are. Yeah. yeah yeah right and so it is it, it, it's destructing it's destructing because it, it, even for us we got to come at it from an angle of okay we got to reprogram ourselves mm -hmm. because traditionally we've been programmed through you know what we see on tv mm -hmm. what our music which is all negative yes so if you have a, a negative self-image of yourself and you don't realize that we come from kings and queens. Yeah. You still yeah. believe in that we evolved from apes and monkeys and, yeah. you know, like we didn't have nothing. Yeah. But that's not true. And so it is. And I think it starts like conversations that we're having where, you know, we could continue to 
uh, uphold each other mm -hmm. or and let us know like yo like what we're doing is good work mm -hmm. now let's push somebody else to do it yeah you know let's let's really empower you know the next generation that's coming up to to realize like you know y'all powerful black folks don't let mm -hmm. anybody tell you that you're not yeah yeah we send our kids to school you talked about education as one of the tools that we need to take our hands on and take more control of you know we when i grew up i grew up in columbus ohio transitioned to worthington worthington is a predominantly white suburb at the time it was probably like at least 95 percent white um and the microaggressions that that exist i still have war wounds from those microaggressions and I think about, you know, I was an, an excellent student. I was an excellent athlete. So uh, in, in some ways I was an asset to the school and I was attacked. The kids, black kids that look like me that weren't as good in the classroom and there's nothing wrong with that, that weren't as good athletes, that they were, they meant nothing to the school. I can't, I don't know how they navigated that space more, but I do know because they collected, they, they band together to protect themselves but I say all this to say we send our kids into the fire every day and we're so busy we don't even realize to check in on them like man they're going into war people who don't believe in their best the the best of themselves are the ones pouring in on them yeah how do we that's the most important piece how do we change that outside of you know we got Dr. Umar Johnson starting a school that never started. Uh, I, I know, let me not hate, because I, I, there's a lot of stuff that when I hear him say, when I hear him speak, I'm like 90% of the stuff he said is on point. Yeah. There's just some other things. Not, but nonetheless, the education piece, you're in education as, as a proliferary. Where do you see, how do we move that for our 20 million plus kids that are going into war? Well, I mean, so part of it is our 20 plus million kids, they're gonna be going into the system. We understand that they're gonna be in the school system, learning this white man's education. But if you can tell them at home, let them be aware of it. Like you need to be aware that you're going into a system that's not built for you. Mm -hmm. That's number one. But you, but there are, there are, there's very much pieces that you need to take advantage of in order for you to, to grow in life. Like you have to go and learn, you have to be, you have to be smart, right? Or do your best in school. Yeah. Um, so it is, it's kind of like that plane of the game that, you know, if you understand that you're going into this, like it's a football game mm -hmm. that you got, that it, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be tough. But when you come home, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to make sure that, that you are getting fed the knowledge that you need to understand as a black boy or as a black girl, mm -hmm. um, you're gonna you're gonna have to move through life just a little bit differently. Yeah. And but at the same time, I'm gonna be here to help you hold people accountable. Like I don't want you going to school and you get upset because you know a white boy call you nigga and you go beat him up. Yeah. Like in your mind and the way I feel about it, yeah, I want you to go beat him up. But I also don't I also know where that leads to, mm -hmm. right? Now you're gonna beat him up, you're gonna be the one get suspended. Yeah. Right? Which is you're gonna track you to somewhere else. So you can't fall for the these these incidents and these ploys that mm -hmm. that's going to happen early on in your life because all the microaggressions is going to show up. Yeah, you be in class as soon as y'all start talking about uh, slavery, mm -hmm. they're gonna look at you. Yeah, right. How do you stand? How do you, how do you present yourself in that in that form and give them the words to use to be prepared and be like, oh, once they start talking about slavery, you need to tell them, yeah, mm -hmm. it was wrong. White people did black people wrong. And, and just be honest and be like, be honest, teacher. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it. Yeah. Right. And if you have if you have other uh, means to bring other people in, you can be like, you know what? My dad, my uncle, my, my big brother. Oh, you know what? I have somebody that's an expert on this conversation also. And this is what he says. Or better yet, can I bring him to class with me? Mm -hmm. You know, just try and give them some ammunition as they maneuver through, because I'm like you. I grew up in this community while yet is black. Our high school is 98%, 95% uh, white. Mm -hmm. Wow. And you end up in a classroom and you look around 
you'd be lucky if you have somebody that looks like you in the class, mm-hmm. right? And it's affluent, so it's a bunch of money. So you coming from an area that's, you know, you know, is, is quote unquote low low income area. Mm-hmm. Now this super wealthy area that's also super white and you got a bunch of kids that come in there and they've only grown up in their whiteness and so yes their microaggressions come out because they talking about oh let me touch your hair mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying it, it it you know why why is all black people skin color different like mm-hmm. they have no idea right like they just because nobody has has ever educated them yeah they didn't you know? have. and so it just you have you just want to want them to be prepared because you don't want them, you don't want our kids to do nothing, um, nothing that will negatively affect them in the long run, yeah. right? And then also let them know like, hey, everybody ain't your friend. Some of them might want to be your friend, but then you need to give them boundaries. I had to help my son navigate this the other day and I had to get on a parent, well, my wife was here, he, he got on a parent. So he's getting a ride home. He, he had to sleep over one of his white friends. He's 12 years old. <laughs> The mom or or the daughter who's like 15 mm-hmm. and the brother, they start getting in an argument in the, on the car ride of them dropping my son off. And the sister was like, oh, well, why don't you tell Kyron that you you that you used the uh that you used the N-word the, with, with the with the hard ER. That's what the uh-huh. young people say, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> N-word with the hard ER. Uh-huh. And so my son, he say he's sitting there. And he li- and they're arguing back and forth, uh-huh. and he don't say he don't say a word. He's like that. I don't even say a word. Yeah. But then the mom dives into the conversation and was like, "Well, if Kyron gets mad at his friend, then Kyron, you're not a good friend." And my son still doesn't say anything, right? He's like, "Yo, like he's like that. I don't even know what to do." Like she what? didn't call, like the the mother didn't call out the daughter or the son about this conversation that they yeah. have. Yeah. So the so the mom pulls up. I think I'm in the shower or something, but my wife goes out um and have this conversation with the mom because the mom is like, yo, I want to talk to Kyron. Kyron, I know Kyron's upset. And you know, my wife is uh, we have no idea about this conversation at this yeah. point, right? Yeah. And he, so she like, what you mean? Why is he upset? Is and then she was just so nonchalant about it, like, well, the kids are was in the car arguing. And um, and you know, talking about the 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 word nigger, and my wife is like, what? Like, wh- what's going on? Like, who's using this word? And how did you deflect onto my son? Yeah. Without you checking your two kids. Mm-hmm. So now that's how that conversation is going. And you know, my wife, who's a principal, had to go and have the conversation with the kids about the word and how you know what I mean, how wrong it is. But yeah. mom, like, what's your problem? Like what? What's your issue, right? Mm-hmm. So now we had to talk to our son about this. Yeah. Right. And I was, and he was like, "Man, this is the first time I ever been in this situation, Dad." Because you know, from my understanding, none of my white friends use that word. Yeah. And and now you know, I mean, how am I supposed to be cool with him, knowing that he used it? And then he was upset, like, with like, what was up with the mom? You know what <laughs> I mean? And I'm like, we just like, she don't not a parent. You yeah. know what I mean? So she's trying to deflect. And take the pressure off of her kids arguing and put it onto you. That has no fault of your own. But I'm like, yo, like, like yeah. that ain't cool. You know what I mean? Like, we just gonna X them out, out the, you know, out of our what you call it for a little while, out of our life. So Kyron put him, put him on pause. Mm-hmm. Was like, yo, like, you know, we for right now we just need a break. Yeah. And and the kid had a hard time with that, right? Because he's like, but Kyron, you're my friend, whatever, whatever. Mm-hmm. Kyron's like, I need a break from you, right? Because yeah. Number one, I didn't know that you, you used that language, mm-hmm. right? And you, you should never use it. You know what I'm saying? And two, you and your sister, y'all got some issues that y'all brought me into this and I mm-hmm. shouldn't have to be into it. So that relationship, you know, never was or never, or, I mean, I know they still see each other because they play sports together. I mean, play sports every now and then or play against mm-hmm. each other. But I'm just like, damn, like, you know, you There's get levels to this early, like, there's levels to this. I think that I think that's the biggest piece that we have to learn is the expectation that we shouldn't love ourselves fully. Mm. And so 
if you, if Kyron's in that situation, he should understand if a white person's upset, I mean, they have the right to use nigger. Like they didn't, they were upset. So they used it properly in that context. But when they're out that context, you should have the grace to forgive them. And you're like, grace or no grace, again, it's seeing my full humanity, which you don't do. And that's why you can be nonchalant about it. And that's how you can deflect it on Kyron, even though this was a situation between he and his sister. Mom should have just squashed it. Like, first of all, that's disrespectful. Uh, she didn't have to lie about what her son didn't and didn't do, but yeah. there was no reason your son needed to be in the equation. But again, yeah. it's that expectation. This is, this is good enough for you. What's wrong with you? Why do you want more or different? Man, Paul, I appreciate your time, man. How do people find the media? I, I, I do want to ask this final question. Was the media attention, did it have any impact on you and your family when you went through this process? I don't think so. This is what I tell people. Um, I didn't get no new followers on Instagram. <laughs> hey, I guess this type of news doesn't move it. But if, yeah, if I didn't get no new out. followers. Um, <laughs> But one thing that I can say is that it's uh, our story continues to push push forward. People recognize our story for what it is. Um, in, our, in our area, different folks will say, hey, you know, I, I appreciate what you're going through, even though you shouldn't have to go through it. Mm -hmm. And this being on both sides of the table, white folks, black folks, and, and others. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it's truly a talking talking piece because it is um, affecting and creating change um, at a at a high level. So that's awesome. That's awesome. Right? And it just shows that throughout the struggle, our people are so resilient. And yeah. we've never the story may say that we lay down and we just but we've always fought behind the scenes. And that's that's what moves progress. True. Nobody's going to just say this is bad. And we're going to change. We change our mind about how we're treating you. You you force the hand and they change your mind. Yeah, that's what you got to do. You got to force it. All right, man. So, Paul, how do they find you? Find, how do they find you and what you do? Oh, so yes, um, you could go to to our website. So, um, I'm a not, I run a nonprofit called Play Moran. So, you go to playmoran.org, um, check us out, or you can look at look us up on all the social medias. You just type in Play Moran, we'll pop up. So, Instagram is Play Moran, Facebook is Play Moran, Twitter Play Moran, um, Instagram. Play Moran. And so that's the nonprofit that I roll with. Um, and if anything else, I'm Googleable. So type in Paul Austin appraisal. There you go. Boy, all over the place. Paul Austin, it's a pleasure to have you. Check him Thank out you. on all his platforms. Play Moran. Check out the appraisal whitewashing your house <laughs> to increase it by half a million dollars. This is Obi Chikuma, Space and Equity. We're all about increasing assets, create new space. Check us out on Instagram, Obi underscore empowers. We've got the YouTube Come Correct podcast. You type in Chikuma or Come Correct, you'll find us there. Website, spaceequitycorp.com. We're all about increasing assets, creating new space. Real bankers for real people. When you come correct, they can't stop you. Paul, we appreciate you, man. Thank you, man. Appreciate you. Keep up the good work.